Hi, I'm Dr. Lewis Cady, and welcome to Cady Wellis Institute for the beginning lecture of the four lecture series on autism awareness for April 2014. It's my pleasure to introduce my colleague, Marcella Piper Terry, uh, who I was telling one of the ladies here before we got started, we just decided that we couldn't live without each other anymore. And so she is back to Katie Wellis to uh, work with biomedical treatments for children and adults and adolescents with autism and also other issues that can be treated from a biomedical basis, including food allergies, toxic metals, yes. um, chronic fatigue, chronic fatigue, Gardasil, fibromyalgia, uh, Gardasil, Gardasil, vaccination, vaccination. metal toxicity. Yes. So anyway, uh, she's going to be presenting tonight, and I'm going to go back there and video it. So, Marcy, okay. take it away. Thank you. Okay. I'm going to grab my little uh, pointer here, and hopefully this will... Hopefully this will go smoothly. Thank you for coming. What a beautiful day outside. I really appreciate you being inside because I don't know that I would have made that choice. So especially after the winter we've had. Um, so I'm Marcy, Marcella Piper Terry. And um, tonight is just going to be an overview. I say just an overview. So um, if your head starts to spin, you might want to kind of, you know, you feel free to stand up and do a little bit of cross moving them over the midline take a few deep breaths and stuff because it can get overwhelming so um, I'm just gonna go to the this is a statement or a, a quote from Baklav Havel uh, I went to a defeat autism now conference in 2005 I was actually had been working with dr. Katie here um, in Evansville at the Katie Wellness Institute and um, we were doing things like the comprehensive digestive stool analysis and um, looking at yeast overgrowth and doing food allergy testing and uh, treating a lot of our patients with, our mutual patients with supplements and seeing really good results. I was also doing this on a personal level with my daughter um, and was seeing excellent results. And uh, so when I went to the first Defeat Autism Now conference, I was like, oh, okay, I've been doing biomedical interventions and I didn't even know it because I thought it was orthomolecular medicine. That's, I, that's what I knew it as and that's what, where it started with Abram Hopfer and um, Linus Pauling. So um, this really resonated with me. Follow those who seek the truth but flee from those who have found it. And um, I'm just gonna Go to the next thing here. So the point is that truth changes slowly. Uh, experts uh, at one point in time talked to us about the flat earth and uh, how many planets are there anyways? I, I remember Pluto at one time was a planet. That's a science thing. And uh, in medicine, and I'm going to hope that I have the pointer right for this. Is it the line? Yes. Okay, there it is. This up here, I don't know if you can see it, it says, give your throat a vacation. Smoke a fresh cigarette. So things do change. Um, these two guys, Dr. J, Barry J. Marshall and J. Robin Warren, um, they won, they received the Nobel Prize in medicine in 2005. In 1982, they discovered the uh, H. pylori bacteria, and they made the discovery that that was actually what was causing um, ulcers. And that was, when they first came out with that, they were like, you're nuts. No, it's stress, it's stress. It's stress that causes ulcers, everybody knows that. So when they came out with this bacterial theory, uh, everybody just, you know, they were heretics. And so, that was 1982. In 1995, antibiotic treatment of H. pylori became the standard of care. 13 years it took for that to happen. So the message on that is that change does happen in medicine, but sometimes it takes a long time. Oops. Okay, so my question now is, can we afford to wait 13 years? The CDC's new numbers that were announced um, at the end of March, said that there's one in 68 American children who now have autism spectrum disorder, and that translates to 14.7 of 1,008 year olds. 
that number is one in 42 boys and one in 189 girls. Here's the kicker. These are old numbers. Those numbers were collected in 2010, so they are now four years old. Children under 12 currently are not included in that number. Um, data sampling is from the way that the ADDM uh, data is collected is from 11 sites. Uh, it's not 11 states, it's 11 sites, one in each of 11 states. And they excluded areas with the highest rates of autism spectrum disorder according to IDEA data. There was only one state out of the top 10 that was included in that, and that was New Jersey. They took a lot of data from the south where the rates are lower. So this is not only an underestimate because of the time, it's also an underestimate because of the way the data was gathered. So what are we really facing? The CDC says this new estimate is roughly, and this is a quote from the CDC website, this new estimate is roughly 30% higher than the estimate for 2008, which was 1 in 88 at that time in 12-year-olds. Um, actually announced in 2012, 12-year-olds, 12 roughly 60% higher than the estimate for 2006, which was 1 in 10, roughly 120% higher than the estimates for 2002 and 2000, which was 1 in 50. We don't know what is causing this increase. Some of it may be due to the way children are identified, diagnosed, and served in their local communities, but exactly how much is unknown. That's directly from the CDC site. So estimates of the true incidence, I'm, a, um, I'm a, a data geek and I like to collect data and um, it was a huge surprise to me when I got to graduate school that I really loved statistics because I hated math in junior high, couldn't stand algebra. Um, that's another story, algebra is really not math, it's language, so it confused me. But um, I am a data geek and when this number, the 1 in 88 number came out, I remembered a paper that was done when the 1 in 50 number came out. And um, it's a Dr. Uh, Yazbak is his name, I believe. But anyway, he wrote a paper that was titled, When 1 in 150 is really 1 in 67. So I started looking. I kind of stole his idea. And I started looking at the data. So I looked at when 1 in 8 is really, all right, 1 in 8, 88 was among 8-year-olds in 2008. So I started extrapolating the data to see what it would be for eight-year-olds in 2009, eight-year-olds in 2010, anyway. So what it came down to, and I did a whole long thing of chicken scratch, and um, in 2012, the number, using the CDC's own rate of increase and their percentage, the number among three-year-olds in 2012 would be one in 29. The 30% increase in using their data from um, the new number, the new numbers, um, in 2014, right now, three-year-olds would be one in 21. And if you take it down to two-year-olds, it's one in 18. And remember, that's still an underestimate because of the way that they collected the data, where they got it from. Oh, and shameless promotion. This is actually, uh, that's the website, that's the article. Um, I didn't link to it because I'm not that shameless, so, okay. Um, so how much is this costing? In 2009, and I, I did this, um, I, I put this originally, this um, presentation together. It's changed quite a bit since then. But in 2009, I first started building this presentation. And I still had this number, um, this number right here. For 2009, the CDC, and at that time it was the current estimates of ASD in the U.S., was 270,087. Now, I was a little confused about that, so I started looking at it today. Actually, that, that was from 2006 data that was reported in 2009. Okay, but at that time, in 2009, they're saying this is what it is. And that includes ages 3 to 22 years. The cost of the lifetime care was estimated to be between $3 million and $3.2 million for each person diagnosed with ASD over the lifespan. And the bulk of that cost is incurred after the age of 22 when they age out of the educational system. All right, and both of these, um, 
these numbers and this information was on Autism Speaks website in 2009 when I first put this together. Uh, so now we have 2010 estimate, the data that was just released, which is four years old, of uh, 1.47 of eight-year-old boy or eight-year-olds. So if we take that 1.47 and we divide it, or, or we take the percentage of four million births, that's the about the approximate birth cohort each year, and we come up with 58,800. That's for each year. That's 58,000. 803 year olds, 58,804 year olds, if we use the CDC's numbers. Which means between ages 3 and 22 years, at 58,800, that's 18 years, we come out with 1,058,400 children diagnosed with autism between the age of 3 and 22 at this point in time. The cost of lifetime care is now. 2,300,000. It's gone down considerably per person, which means we have more kids, more people being diagnosed with autism, and we are spending less on each individual person because we are cutting programs. And we have got a crisis on our hands. This is an epidemic, that E word that everybody's afraid to say. So the majority of cost is still incurred after age 22, and the source was um, today or no, I looked it up today, but um, from February 10th, 2014. So is this due to better diagnosis? That's a huge jump, isn't it? You know, I mean, that's, that's a lot. Uh, where are all the autistic adults if it's better diagnosis? If they've always been here, where are they now? And, and I actually have a little insight on that because for the last 16 months, I've been working as a behavior analyst with adults in group homes. And I have um, approximately between 40 and 50 people total. I'm also working with waiver clients. Um, but the adults in the group homes, I've worked with uh, five different group homes. The age range is like 18 to 80, um, males and females. Of those, I have two male adults diagnosed with autism, and they, they earned the diagnosis. And I have uh, two in their 40s and two in their 30s. And that's it. All the other ones are, uh, uh, that are above the age of 25 have different diagnoses, which is cerebral palsy, and schizophrenia, and um, developmental disabilities. So different diagnoses. Of the younger ones that are coming in now, almost completely 100%. I, I'm afraid to say 100% because I don't want somebody to say, well, it wasn't because there was that one that you forgot. So it could be. But somewhere around 100% are autism. And they're not misdiagnosed. And they're between the ages of 18 and 23, 24, 25. So it's not better diagnosis. There is a genuine difference. Um, is it genetics? Genes account for 38% of autism risk, with environmental factors explaining the remaining 62%. And that is from a study that was done at Stanford University um, in July of 2011. And there is no such thing as a genetic epidemic. Can't happen. So this was a poll that parents took. Um, it's been a few years ago now. They polled over 5,000 parents who had children with autism spectrum diagnoses. And the question was, when my child is an adult, he will, one, live independently, two, live independently but require minimal support, live in a group home, will probably never leave home. And 50% answered that their child would either be in a group home or would never leave home. So the goal in my opinion, has to be to increase the probability of independence. Uh, Sydney McDonald Baker was one of the, um, he's one of the authors, I'm going to hold up this book, from Defeat Autism Now, the Autism Research Institute in San Diego, California, um, used to have a, a think tank called Defeat Autism Now, and it was, uh, there were doctors and nurses and health professionals from all over the world that would get together a couple times a year and sit down and try to figure out what is going on. 
Sidney McDonald Baker was one of the authors of this book, which is the Biomedical Bible. And he's awesome. Um, in my opinion, it's the Biomedical Bible. <laughs> I've had it since 2005, and I don't ever want it to leave my sight. Um, but he talked about the first tax law. If you are sitting on a tack, it takes a lot of Risperdal to make it feel better. Um, the appropriate treatment for tack sitting is tack removal. Second tax law is if you are sitting on two tacks, removal of one does not produce a 50% improvement. Chronic illness is or becomes multifactorial. Okay, so when I see a child or when somebody that's doing biomedical consulting or biomedical um, practice and looking at the medical aspect of autism, that's what we're talking about. We're not talking about the behavioral aspect of autism. Been doing that. I want to see what we can do and I know what we can do. I want to get back to doing what we can do to help these kids feel better because when they feel better and their bodies work better, they behave better and they socialize better. So these are things that I would use. The questionnaire is details, details, details. It is now more than 20 pages long and it asks everything I can possibly think of and it's constantly growing because I'm always seeing things that I, you know, I see it a couple times and then I see it again and then it's like, okay, I gotta put that on the, on the questionnaire. Um, so I ask about conception. I ask if there were miscarriages before conception. I ask about the pregnancy. I ask if, you know, did you have, did mom have, uh, have the flu vaccine? Did mom have the Tdap vaccine? Did mom have, med have dental work done? Do you have amalgam fillings? Did you have a root canal? Did you, uh, did, did you get sick and have to take antibiotics during the pregnancy? Did you take a lot of Tylenol during the pregnancy? Did you have acid reflux and take, um, take um, antacids, which are high in aluminum? All of those things. Did you crave certain things? Did you, chew, did you crave ice and chew ice? Because that's a sign that maybe you got an iron deficiency, which could mean that lead might be associated with that. It also could mean problems with B12, which is involved in the methylation pathway and detoxification. So this is why I ask all this stuff. It's like, wow, you ask a lot of questions, and I do. Um, the chronological history form is basically just a timeline and um, some, I think some, I know some practices have a specific chronological history form. I tend to uh, ask for medical records and vaccination records and I do my own timeline um, because I'm obsessive that way and I don't want to miss anything. So um, the narrative, I want to know what did you see and what do you think happened? I, I, I remember uh, not so many years ago watching a, um, a news reporter interviewing Dr. Wakefield and he was saying that he listened to the parents and the news reporter said, well, why would you listen to the parents? They're not the experts. But the parents are the experts on that child. You are the expert on your child. I want to see the growth curve. If we have it, if we have access to it, growth curve is great. Part of that is because a lot of kids um, around a certain time, they start to get really big heads. And that has been associated with um, encephalopathy and brain swelling. So we want to look at that. Um, old lab and clinical records, photographs and videos are great to see because we can see a lot of these kids were smiling, they were interactive, they were talking, and then something happened and they stopped. So we want the parental interview. This is the intake. The parent comes in. We sit down. I usually do three hours with the parent and the child if the child is little and has a, or if the child is older and has a really big problem with attention, then I ask them to bring somebody with them so that they can take the child and, and I can talk with the parent and we can kind of tag team. And then, of course, observation of the child. All right, so the, there, the general history, I want to know about the family history, particularly interested in autoimmune diseases, um, GI problems, allergies, diabetes. The number one frequent, uh, the most frequent finding of autoimmune disease was, um, and this was from a while back, so, but uh, I would assume it's probably still true, is uh, autoimmune thyroiditis in the mother. 
And autoimmune thyroiditis is also frequently misdiagnosed as bipolar disorder. And that's because lead targets the thyroid. And lead also displaces calcium in the brain and causes hyperactivity um, in an enzyme called protein kinase C. And it's related to super two calci extra, extra calcium and it causes mania. So, and I learned all of that because my mother was um, exposed to lead and um, had very significant chronic problems from it. So I did a lot of studying about that. Um, okay, so, and that's important because toxins are synergistic and that's something that nobody talks about. What's, being, what's in the mom prior to the birth of this child, particularly if it's lead or other heavy metals, lead displaces calcium. So if mom had history of lead, and lead doesn't leave your body, it stores in bone. And it is pulled out of bone at times when someone is, when the body's pulling for calcium, which is pregnancy and fetal development and breastfeeding. And lead is synergistic with even the most minute amount of mercury and other heavy metals. So that's very significant to me. Um, so I already talked about this. Uh, neonatal, I want to know, you know, was this child, was this child a spontaneous vaginal delivery? Was it a C-section? Was, was, was the baby induced? Did you have a lot of ultrasounds? Um, what medications during the pregnancy? And um, breastfeeding, did you breastfeed? Was the baby colicky from the get-go? Did you have to change formula? Did you have to change multiple times? Was the baby on soy formula? Soy formula is very, very problematic and very frequent. Um, <clears throat> California is the only state thus far that has outlawed high levels of manganese in soy formula. Manganese is, uh, it targets mitochondria. And um, soy formula is bad from a standpoint that it, it, boys, little boys should never have soy formula because it has, it's so estrogenic. Um, but nobody should really have soy formula um, because of it, because of what it does to the central nervous system and to the mitochondria. Um, so, and then I want to know about environmental exposures. I want to know where you live. Do you have city water, well water? Do you, do you have a filter? Um, do you have mold in your house? Are there any, is there a history of tick bites? Lyme uh, is a big issue with a lot of kids with autism. And it's not just whether they got bit, and, and the parents may never have, may not have a history of, of known tick bites either. But that's something that, is, that we're finding a lot in children with autism. And we want to know where you live. Well, we live here. Um, our air it has the highest level of heavy metals, sulfur dioxide, and nitrogen dioxide of any place in the United States. We have 17 coal burning power plants within a 50 mile radius of Evansville. And we have a lot of heavy metals. And um, the only place that has worse air quality than we do is China. So we've got a lot built up, and we're having, we're passing it to our babies. Um, I want to know about parents' and grandparents' occupations, because it matters if your grandfather worked in a coal mine. It matters if your grandfather owned a gas station. It's not just what mother is passing on, or grandmother is passing on, because these toxins are mutagenic. They damage DNA, and that DNA is passed to subsequent generations. That's actually, and this is a conversation that I've had with a lot of people that say, well, I, it, it can't be vaccines because my child was not vaccinated and has autism. And so I said, well, I've seen that before. That does exist. You know, I'm not saying that vaccines are the only thing. Absolutely not. It's multiple factors. It's epigenetic. It's what is being passed, the genetic, dis the genetic problems that are being passed, and that makes that child more vulnerable to something when that child is exposed to those same kinds of toxins. But uh, without, without exception, every history that I've investigated personally um, where there was a child with autism that did, not, that did not regress after vaccines or was not vaccinated at all, um, there was a history of vaccines in the parents. A lot of the in Air Force, the military, uh, my husband was in the Air Force, uh, military personnel are the most highly vaccinated adults in the United States. And that's what that one in, when one in 150 was one in 67, that's what that was about. That's, that's military personnel. That's children of military personnel. The rate was um, approximately twice as high. 
All right. Um, history and specifics. I want to know onset and triggers. Was this child different from birth? And that's, you know, people say, well, my child didn't regress. Vaccines didn't have anything to do with it. It was different from birth. Was your child vaccinated against hepatitis B on the first day of life? How can you tell? Did you get Rogams? Two of them in the pregnancy. I did. Uh, okay, so we want to know about onset and triggers. And then there's some that are just, you know, they're just amazing and they're, they're perfect and lovely and wonderful and, and, and just, you just want to eat them up and snuggle and, you know, you don't want to go anywhere because you can't stand to leave that kid because they're just so adorable and then all of a sudden, boom, they're gone. And, and you don't know what happened. Well, you know what happened, but nobody else seems to know what happened. So I want to know about diet. Do they have cravings and do they have reactions to, fit to certain foods? That's a big trigger. I mean, that's a big, a big clue. If a kid, you know, when somebody comes in and their ch child has autism, I can't tell you how many times parents look at me and they go, how did you know that? Because I'll say, I know what your kid eats. Your kid eats pizza and macaroni and cheese and chicken nuggets and apples and grapes and your kid drinks pickle juice. How'd you know that? And ketchup on everything. How'd you know that? Because the kid has an overgrowth of yeast and is craving fermented things, craving ketchup, ranch salad dressing. Yeast grows on the outside of apples, on the skin of the apples, and it also grows on grapes, which is why we use them for wine, because they ferment. Um, okay, so we want to think about stool, constipation, diarrhea, and copresis. Um, smearing of stools, overflow around impacted stool. A lot of parents think that their children have, um, they don't have constipation because they have diarrhea. They have severe diarrhea. But a lot of times what that is is that there is a plug of stool and then feces or fecal matter is coming out around that plug. So you have a mixed presentation of both. Um, that's a big issue with, particularly with yeast, yeast overgrowth and with uh, food allergies. Um, want to know if the kid's had any illnesses. Did he have a head injury? Um, has he had any injuries? Uh, or what illnesses? Let me go back to that. What kind of illnesses and the timing of those illnesses? I want to look at that. Um, did the child develop chicken pox immediately or within a short time after getting the chicken pox? Did this child develop a, a atypical measles from the measles vaccine and then get it again later? Seen that too. Um, Medications, what medications is the child on now? What medications has the child been on? Did the ch is this a kid who has real, really big reactions to medications? Do they not do well with medications? That is very, very common, particularly with psych medications because they are processed through the same detox pathway the toxins are processed through. And they go through that P450 pathway and if that is messed up or it's blocked because they're trying to detoxify and they can't, then they're not gonna have really good re response to medications that are processed through the liver. Okay, did they have vaccine reactions? Um, I have a friend, well, a colleague who is uh, who's also a behavior analyst and she's the mother of um, a child with autism and we were talking about this and she's been doing behavior analysis for quite some time and she said, uh, I've never, I've personally never had a mother tell me that her child did not regress after vaccines or that she didn't think vaccines had anything to do with it. So it's pretty common. And this is actually not supposed to be the vaccine talk, but I'm sorry. Um, so I want to know signs and symptoms. What do they do? What, how do they behave? What kinds of things might be associated with what's going on underneath physically? Does, can you, uh, is the child really tender headed? Do they not want to have their head touched? Does the child put a lot of pressure on their head? Do they kind of butt like a goat? Um, all of those are clues about what might be going on underneath. Excuse me. Um, so, and that's the, all of that is part of the questionnaire. Whoop. All right, so um, gut dysfunction, some signs of gut dysfunction. Gut dysfunction is extremely common. I don't think I've ever seen a child or an adult with autism that did not have gut dysfunction. It is, I've never seen it since 2005. Um, they have a history of severe colic and frequent vomiting. They'll pre a lot of times, that's why they get switched from formula to formula, because they can't tolerate milk at all. And guess what is one of the symptoms of acute lead toxicity? Gastrointestinal colic. Um, 
milk-based formula intolerance, soy, GERD, gastroesophageal reflux disease. I don't personally think there is such a thing. I think it's a symptom of what's going on underneath, but it's now a disease because then they can sell a drug to treat the disease. Um, failure to thrive. My daughter was diagnosed with failure to thrive, um, and uh, she, she just could not gain weight and um, was below the 10th percentile um, for a long, long time, was four years old before she weighed 30 pounds. And um, she, uh, I didn't realize this until after my husband retired from the military and I hand carried our medical records, but I was very, very close to being referred for counseling for suspicion of um, neglect because she could not gain weight. Um, wasted butters, they just don't have any fat because they're not processing anything. Distended abdomen and doughy, bloated belly, that's like a Buddha belly kind of thing, and sort of that bloat, especially in older kids, you'll see kind of that cellulite looking kind of doughy sort of thing, that's a wheat belly. That's a clue. Um, strategies to put the pressure on their abdomen. They'll, you know, a lot of the kids, they'll, they'll lean over the table and they'll, or they'll, um, they'll get down and, and they'll rock back and forth like this. And, and from a behavior analyst standpoint, they're stimming. They're not stimming, they're in pain. Until we rule out something underlying it, it's cruel to say, well, that's just a stem and treat it from a behavioral standpoint. We need to assess what's going on and treat their pain. Um, okay, hands in their pants, put, uh, same thing, pressure and probing. This, this can mean, it can mean um, yeast. It can mean um, parasites. Parasites also very, very frequent. Okay, on with the gut dysfunction. Um, diarrhea, constipation, grainy stools. Um, this is a sign of insoluble bile salts and they need taurine. If the stools are, uh, look like they have sand in them and they're sticky and you can't get them, you can't, that's, that's an indication that they may need some taurine and um, that's something we would look at. So these again are clues. Um, they, if they've had a history of frequent antibiotics, which a lot of them have, my daughter had, uh, she started getting ear infections after her four month vaccinations and um, she, her, it was constant. She would get off of one and we'd have to put her on another one and get her on another one and get her on another one. And, I, and then she had stomatitis and conjunctivitis and upper respiratory um, infections. And um, when I finally, and ear infections, did I say that? Uh, when I finally got her medical record, well, I had them, when I finally did the timeline on them and looked at what was going on, she started within two weeks with ear infections of her four month vaccines and she had 40 rounds, more than 40 rounds of antibiotics by the time she was four. And she had two sets of tubes. Um, so she had no good gut flora left. It was wiped out, it's gone. But it doesn't take 40 or 50 rounds of antibiotics to do that. Sometimes it only takes one. And sometimes all it takes is the one that mom gets in the pregnancy. And sometimes a C-section will do that. Well, C-section will do that because they don't go through the birth canal, so they don't, they don't colonize. They don't get the good bacteria. Okay, so they have rash, peeling feet, ridged, discolored nails. This is, these are signs of yeast. Inflamed cheeks and a red ring around the anus. That can be yeast. It can also be a sign of biotin deficiency, which is also very common. Um, they frequently have ringworm and tinea corporis capitis, which is a skin kind of thing. Um, okay, so again, immune dis dysregulation. These are signs of immune dysregulation. How common is eczema? Hi, eczema is huge. I, we ne I never saw eczema when I was a kid, you know, but it's huge. Eczema is a sign of an immune dysregulation and it is very frequently associated with a wheat allergy or gluten allergy. Um, dermatographism is um, where you can kind of take your finger and go down the line and the skin will you can draw on it. That's graphism. You can draw on your skin. Um, allergic rhinitis and asthma. Some of these kids, they just pour from their noses and nothing helps it. Um, asthma. A few years ago, um, I was doing a little bit of research and I don't know what the level is now, but in the Evansville Vanderburg School Corporation at that point in time, uh, more than 25% of the children in the EVSC had an inhaler in the nurse's office. One in four. That didn't used to be the case. I remember my, my first cousin had asthma when we were kids, and I, it was so fascinating to me because I didn't know anybody else who had asthma at all. 
Um, okay, so warts. Very common. Warts is a, a viral infection. Very, very common in kids with autism, and it's, it's one of those clues about immune system dysfunction. Um, molluscum contagiosum is a skin infection caused by a virus. Herpes, um, particularly uh, HHV6 is huge in our kids. Uh, cytomegalovirus is also pretty common. Um, any kind of history of uh, simplex one or, or HSV one or two. Um, chickenpox, history of chickenpox, if they broke out in the chickenpox or they got a rash after they got the vaccine, that's a sign that something about their immune system did not respond to that vaccine the way it was supposed to. Um, strep, bronchitis, tonsillitis, recurrent ear infections. Strep is a biggie. Um, and so are some of the other ones. MRSA, a lot of our kids have MRSA, recurrent MRSA. So they, it, it's, and again, they're not, having an, they're not having a normal response to antibiotics. They're not having, they, they can't process all of the viruses and the bacteria that are inhabiting their body. So their immune systems are not working appropriately. Um, okay, so very frequent zinc deficiency. This is what I would look at when I look at a child and I would say, okay, I wanna see your, uh, let me see your fingernails. Can I see your fingernails? Please, can I see your fingernails? Thank you so much. And I want to see if that child has white spots or lines on their nail or if their nails are splitting. I want to see what the nails look like. I want to see what the bed of the nail looks like because I can t you can look at that and kind of look at yeast. You can look at um, zinc deficiency, essential fatty acid deficiency. Um, so that's really important to me. Um, so I want to see what the skin. Older, older kids have particularly lots of acne. If their hair is falling out, if you have a teenager whose hair is falling out, that's a sign signal that something's going on there. Um, and psoriasis, uh, canker sores, viral infection, so, um, and zinc deficiency. So essential fatty acid clues are keratosis pilaris, which is that, um, they call it chicken skin, on the upper arms and on the um, tops of the thighs. And that is very, very frequently um, an issue with our kids. Um, and then dry, coarse hair, and I already mentioned the splitting, peeling nails. Um, magnesium deficiency, these are some signs of magnesium deficiency. Muscle twitches and tingling. And kids who are falling asleep at night and then all of a sudden they go, and they jerk like that, that's a clue. Um, frequent, whoops. I did it. I knew I was going to do it. Where do we go? Ah, good. Okay. Um, frequent heavy sighing. Just <sighs> like a pregnant woman. That's a magnesium deficiency sign. Um, salt craving, chocolate craving. Chocolate is high in magnesium. And sometimes I've had somebody tell me the other day that since she's been taking magnesium, she's not eating chocolate anymore. She's not craving it. You know, she can, she can stop at one piece. Irritability, anxiety, hyperkinetic behavior, and seizures are all signs of magnesium deficiency. And magnesium deficiency and zinc deficiency, those are calcium, magnesium, zinc, and elemental lithium. Magic minerals. They are the essential minerals and they have to be in balance. And when they are out of balance, you lose your protection against heavy metals. You also become very anxious. And magnesium and zinc are active in more than, each one is active in more than 300 enzymatic processes throughout the body. So when they're whacked out, everything's whacked out. And um, that, that elemental lithium is, is, is a big piece. Okay. Um, diagnostic labs. These are the, this is kind of like the basis of what we would do, you know, um, with everybody. Because we want to see how this person, the first thing we want to do before we start doing anything is we want to find out what's going on. Um, so from the, cl from the clues, from the history, and from the, um, from the medical records, we would look and we would definitely do, uh, we don't always do a urinalysis, but um, some people do. Um, CBC, chem screen, and we would do CBC with manual diff, um, chem screen liver, to check liver and kidney function. We would do a thyroid panel, not just a TSH, and we would also check for, autoimmune, uh, for uh, thyroid antibodies. We would look at iron and ferritin and zinc and copper, and we're looking at plasma, not um, just a blood draw. We want, we want to see what the cellular levels are because it can be very misleading if you don't check what's going on inside the cell. And then methylmalonic acid, which looks at B12 levels. A lot of times these kids will have high levels 
of B12, or the B12 will look like it's just fine, and the B6 will be high, and folate might be high. Folic acid might also be high. And so you might say, well, they don't have a problem with that. We don't need to supplement that because it's high. Well, the reason it's high is because it's building up in the body because it's not being used. It's bio-unavailable because it's not the right form or because something is missing in the methylation pathway that needs to be there. There's a cofactor that's missing that's really important. And remember the, um, well, I don't think I said this yet, but heavy metals, particularly mercury and lead, they destroy enzymes throughout the body. So it causes things not to work the way they're supposed to. Um, okay, so vitamin A, it, we definitely would check that. Um, vitamin A is very important for viruses. Um, there's some really good medical literature going back uh, decades about the treatment of measles virus with um, high-dose vitamin A. Not something I would recommend to do without some guidance um, because high levels of vitamin A can be toxic. And there are certain types of vitamin A that would be um, much more effective um, than others. So uh, it's not something that, you know, oh, wow, I think my child had a measles reaction, so I'm going to go give them a whole bunch of vitamin A. Don't do that. Um, we want to check ASO and anti-DNAs to rule out PANDAS. PANDAS is pediatric autoimmune neuropsychiatric disorder associated with streptococcus. It has now been changed because we now know that it's not just strep. It, is, it can be other bi uh, bacterial infections. It can be viral infections. It can be um, Lyme. So it's now changed to PITANS, which is Pediatric Infectious something. Anyway, it's PITANS. Take my word for it. Um, so, uh, and I can't believe I forgot that. But anyway, so, so, but this is one that we, you know, particularly if the kid has a history, a known history of strep, or if it's a teenager and they have cyclical behavior that elevates and looks like bipolar disorder and they've never had strep. They've never had strep? I don't know a teenager who's never had strep. But if a teenager's never had strep and they have um, a sudden onset of arguing with a wall or um, oppositional defiant kinds of behavior, um, extreme ADHD, uh, really, you know, just the kid has changed. Something changed and that goes on for maybe six or eight weeks and then it goes away. And then it comes back. And it gets worse in the fall, and it gets worse in the spring. Those are clues that we might need to check to see if this child has an autoimmune response to strep. Because we know that kids get exposed at school in the fall and spring to strep in the classroom. And if the kid's not having a normal reaction, has never had strep, then it might be that that child is having an autoimmune reaction and it is attacking the brain. It's attacking the basal ganglia and the anterior cingulate gyrus, and it is causing that kid to go round and round and round and round and round and become very, very obsessive and very anxious. And sometimes it attacks another area and it can cause the kid to suddenly not be able to walk. And they might be, become very, you know, sort of like they're drunk. So there, it can have different kinds of presentations. There's also a type of pandas, um, a type of strep, autoimmune strep, that attacks the, um, the gastrointestinal tract and children will, and kids will feel sick when they eat, so they stop eating. And if it's a girl, and she happens to be 12 or 13, and she stops eating, then she gets diagnosed with anorexia, and it's all in her head, but nobody's checking her strep levels. So we need to be thinking about those things. Um, we look at immunoglobulins. This is to assess immune function. Our kids, they're, you know, we've got, all these, we've got all these signs that maybe something's going on that's causing these kids to react in ways that are different from their peers. And it's related to how their immune system is responding to things or not responding to things the way we want them to. So we want to see what's going on there. And then we want viral titers. And we usually get measles, mumps, rubella, HSV1 and 2, um, cytomegalovirus, um, HHV6. Um, probably forgetting something because I don't have it in front of me. But the ones that I have seen um, personally to be really problematic, and there's some research on this, are high measles titer, very high measles titer, like 10 times, 20 times higher than what it should be in order to establish immunity, um, in combination with a very high HHV6 titer. And those two things together seem to, um, in some cases, set off an autoimmune attack on myelin basic protein and neuron axon filament protein. And those two proteins, neuron axon, the neuron axon is the thing that makes your brain communicate from one side to the other, back and forth, and between all of the areas of the brain. 
and that, my, that neuron axon is insulated with myelin sheath. So if the myelin is damaged, not working right, or it's a, it, the body's attacking the myelin, and if the body's attacking the neuron, that neuron axon, you get sensory integration dysfunction because the brain's not communicating. Okay, next. All right, so common lab findings, high copper, uh, low zinc. Copper and zinc are on a seesaw. One goes up, the other one goes down. Um, low ma oops, high copper, the signs of high copper, um, copper makes, uh, makes people, uh, cop high copper can cause signs of schizophrenia, can cause hallucinations, high emotionality, very, very emotionality can cause, um, uh, I mean, it, the, somebody will look like they're schizophrenic with high copper. Um, zinc is a calming mineral, and we already talked about how important zinc is. So uh, low magnesium, low calcium, which is secondary, um, because these are, these are displaced, and a lot of times calcium is low where we want it to be, but it starts building up in places where it's not supposed to be, like the heart and the kidneys and pain in the feet, bunions. Um, I have a theory that part, part, of why, part of why some kids toe walk, and I know there's other, other theories about this, but I, I think sometimes kids toe walk because their heels hurt. And that could be because they have oxalate crystals building up in their feet, and it could be also uh, B vitamin deficiency, or both. Um, low iron, low vitamin A, high IgE eosinophils. This is a, um, I'm learning a lot from somebody that I care about very much who has this. And um, it's been a very big challenge because um, his mom has been working with him for years to, they did, they did everything right. They did gluten-free, casein-free, do, uh, dairy-free, I mean, uh, corn-free, soy-free, all of those things. And she's an awesome mom and she cooks from scratch and she does everything, you know, organic. And, um, and he just wasn't, you know, he was progressing. He did really well, but then it didn't, you know, they didn't make, continue to make those gains. And what we found out was when the right testing was done, we found out that he has something called oral allergy syndrome. And he has problems with pollination and he has problems with foods that are cross-pollinated from things that he's allergic to, like, you know, like weeds and all that kind of stuff. So the foods that are cross-pollinated with that are the things that he was allergic to, which are the fruits and vegetables she was feeding him because he's supposed to be gluten-free, casein-free, dairy-free, soy-free, and all that kind of stuff. This is where testing is really important because you can spend a lot of time and a lot of money and if, you're, if you don't have the data, if, you know, I mean, it's, it's good to try, but if you're not getting anywhere, then that's a sign we need to figure out why. Um, so high MMA, we already talked about that with low intracellular B12, and I know I'm going really long, and I'm sorry, but. Um, so these are diagnostic lab testing, the primary. We've got to have that data. So we make the right decisions. We want, this is a very standard thing, a uh, organic acids test. This test for metabolites for yeast, bacterial infections, um, parasites, toxins. Um, HPHPA is, is something that frequently is identified as or interpreted as being um, a bacterial infection, but HPHPA can also be elevated because of exposure to VOCs, which is volatile organic compounds. So when I see somebody that has uh, HPHPA up high, I want to know, did you just get your carpet replaced in your house? Or did you, get, did you do some remodeling and that kind of stuff? Because we want to rule that out, because that helps us to determine if we're looking for a bacterial infection or if we're actually looking at VOCs. Um, so we want to do a comprehensive digestive stool analysis. We want to look at what's going on in the stool. Is there undigested food? Are there parasites? Is there signs of parasites? They can be really tricky because they like to hide. They don't like to come out. Um, and some bacteria don't like to come out either because they're anaerobic. So when the stool comes out, the bacteria go, boop, they're gone. So um, that can be kind of tricky, but it's also very important because it, it can give us a baseline. It can show us you know, what we're tracking. Oops, I did it again. Um, IgG food <coughs> antibodies, including anti-gliadin antibody. Um, we also have done in the past, um, we've done uh, tissue transglutaminase. I, I think this is important, and the reason I think it's important is because for the very reason of, you know, a lot of people will do gluten-free, casein-free, and they'll substitute soy and corn. They'll go to soy milk because they, you know, they think it's safe and it's not, um, not a good idea. And this, the, the molecules in soy, the, the proteins in soy are very close to the proteins in casein, so it, it doesn't work. You can't go to soy because the body sees it as milk, the same thing. 
Um, a lot of people go to almond milk if they have high oxalates or if they have an allergy to tree nuts, then that's going to be problematic too. So this can be, there's a, you know, some people say it's not necessary to do, to do the IgG food antibodies. You know, what I would say is let's do a trial of the diet and see where we get with it so that you, you know, you may not have to. If you get really good progress with it, that's a good test. That's the gold standard is do an elimination diet and let's see where we get. If we're not getting where we want to go, then we probably need to do that. Um, neopterin, which is an immune marker in the urine. Porphyrin, which is a, um, heavy metals. Um, that's a test that actually was developed in uh, France and is a good marker of heavy metals. And it's good because you don't have to do a urine provocation test on that, it, and, which I have a problem with urine provocation tests for heavy metals, especially in children, um, especially in children who are nonverbal because they can't tell us what they're feeling. Um, and if they're, what we have learned over the last several years is that these kids who have um, methylation problems, they have an MTHFR defect, which is something we are testing for now. Um, and, and I'm not going to tell you what MTHFR is referred to in the autism moms and dads community, but you might be able to, um, to use your imagination because uh, we don't like it. And um, because it's really tough, it has been very tough, but now we have some good tests that tell us where that pathway is broken, where the SNPs are and what we need to do to fix it. And that's huge because when we can fix it, then we're not just pulling out what is there now. If we can fix it, then we can help them start to detoxify on their own. And that's huge, especially when you live in an area where you've got an ongoing exposure. Um, all right, so I do hair analysis. A lot of people don't like hair analysis because it takes a long time to learn how to interpret. I had to learn how to interpret it because I'm not an MD and I can't order urine provocation tests and I think that's just God telling me I'm not supposed to. So I do hair analysis. It's a very good tool. I've got some great books. I study them. Um, I, uh, I know what patterns look like and when I don't, I know where to go to get some answers. And hair analysis is a good way of testing what's going on in the body over time. It's much better than testing blood. When you test for heavy metals in blood, you're probably not going to find anything unless the kid is eating lead chips right now, you know, because it circulates and then it deposits. So hair tells us what is going on in, on a cellular level in the, player, in the places where those metals are hiding. And it's a really good tool. It's not, it's not invasive. It's not very expensive. And you can do it, you can repeat it like once every three to six months and you can see how you're progressing. It's a really good way to check progression. And it's really nice if you have a kid who doesn't like to get stuck because you don't have to stick them. Um, complete thyroid panel, we have talked about that, and others as indicated from the history. So that's where that family history comes in. You know, what's going on in the family? We might want to check and see if it's going on in the kid. Diabetes is one. We want to see, does this kid, is part of the behavior issue? Does he have a glucose issue? Is he having glucose problems? Does diabetes run in the family? Um, okay. Um, these are secondary. These are some other, you know, kind of fancy schmancy stuff that we would do afterwards. The premier autism panel I, may or may not be, you know, I mean, it, it gives a lot of information, but um, I think by the time we get to this point, we probably don't need it most of the time. Um, urine, hair, and fecal metals are things that a lot of people do. I like this one. Um, I don't want to, I, I, I don't believe in giving someone, unless it's a really, really severe, you know, thing, or if it's somebody that just cannot get any kind of, I mean, sometimes people do it to get insurance coverage because you have to show that it's there in order to get it covered. But the danger of that is, is if you've got somebody that's constipated or has an injured gut or has um, their, their pathways aren't working, their detox pathways aren't working very well, then you run the risk when you give a chelating agent to in a provocation test, you run the risk of pulling metals out of their storage places like the kidneys and in soft tissues like the heart and in the body. And then it can, and mercury is one of those. I mean, it goes there, but it also goes to the brain. And once mercury gets in the brain, it does not want to come out. So when you chelate, when you give a chelating agent that pulls lead and mercury from other areas of the body and you can't get rid of it, then some of that is going to recirc and some of that is going to go into the brain when it wasn't there before. So that's my problem with, that's why I don't like it. Um, and I will, I mean, I, I know there, I, th th I've been told that there are cases when it's really a matter of we got to get the metals out as quickly as possible because we're not going to make any headway if we don't. 
Um, I haven't seen one of those cases, so I don't know what I would do at that time. I would probably have to think about it. Um, and I would definitely ask for help <laughs> um, from everybody I could think of. Um, so we also look at plasma amino acids. We want to see how, you know, how are their amino acids? Are they, are they utilizing protein? Or are they wasting protein? Um, fatty acids, very important for detoxification and for brain function and CNS, uh, central nervous system. Genetic testing, that's that NTHFR. So common lab findings, low taurine, low selenium. Um, I remember reading a story, uh, or, or a, not a story, but a, a research paper. I, I was very interested in, um, and this is going to be controversial, but I was very interested in, in uh, HIV epidemic um, years ago in the uh, 1980s and 1990s. And um, I read a research, I read some research on um, the incidence of HIV virus in, um, in sub-Saharan Africa. And I'm trying to think now, I think it was Senegal was uh, a country that had a very low incidence of HIV, and they were trying to figure out why. And it's because they had high levels of selenium in their soil, so protected against the virus. Very good for um, viral activity. Low folate. This is really, kids on the spectrum frequently have problems processing folic acid because it is synthetic. The body doesn't recognize it. They can't utilize it, so it builds up. And they end up getting, even though they look like they've got lots of folic acid in their body, they have uh, cerebral folate deficiency because it's not getting where it needs to go. So we would use folinic acid or methylfolate, um, frequently in combination with methyl B12. Low um, essential fatty acids, low natural killer cell activity, low B vitamins, high yeast bacterial metabolites in the urine, high viral titers, high IgG antibodies to casein and gluten, which... Um, we'll talk about this more in, in another presentation, but these uh, casein and gluten, when they can't be broken down in the gut um, because you've got an injured gut, those are big proteins and it's hard to break them down. And, you know, DPP4, and um, I've just learned two other enzymes. I think it's uh, case of more, uh, I'm not going to say what it is, but anyway, 4.5 and something else. It was like, I was thinking it was like uh, Windows, you know. But I attended a conference over the weekend. He was um, talking about specific enzymes. But the thing is, is enzymes enzymes, 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 are deactivated by heavy metals. So we can't break them down. So we eat gluten and casein. It can't be broken down. The gut is injured. Yeast takes over. You get intestinal hyperpermeability, which means things break through and go into the bloodstream. Those proteins not broken down can go into the receptors. They're like a little key that goes into a lock in a receptor for opiates. So it's like being, making, they're manufacturing their own pain medicine, basically, which is why a lot of kids and adults on the spectrum have very high pain tolerance because they're drugged. They're, they're on their, they're making their morphine. And they are, morphine, you know, pain medication causes constipation. We got a lot of constipation. So, and that's also why they won't want to eat anything else. They don't want it. They don't want vegetables. They don't want anything except their gluten and their casein because they are not eating for food. They're drugging. So, um, and this is much more widespread than just ASD. This is not just a ASD. This is also ADHD. ADHD, those kids, our kids, they get up in the morning and they eat their cereal and their milk and they and they, um, they get their gluten and their casein, and then they go off to school, and they're kind of spacey, and they're sort of, you know, they're quiet or whatever. And then about 10, 30, 11 o'clock, when it starts to wear off, they start doing this, and they look like little druggies, and they're irritable, and they're messing with you because they can't wait to get to the cafeteria to get their pizza and their milkshake because that's their fix. And then after lunch, they start zoning out, and they're and then the whole thing recycles again. So about 2.30 or 3 o'clock, they're irritable, and they're doing the leg shaking, and they look like a little druggy, don't they? I mean, they look like little crackheads. So they're, and they're wanting their fix. So they get home, the whole thing recycles again, they raid the cabinets, and this goes like this all day long. And they look like rapid cycler bipolar kids. But we need to check for this. All right. Autoantibodies, um, antibodies to self. 
The thing about autoantibodies is that when your body is fighting so many things at once, we have so much energy, only so much energy in our immune system. And when our immune system is so busy trying to fight off all of these other things, it gets confused about where it's supposed to be firing and we become the victim of friendly fire. That's autoimmune disease. All right, so I know I'm going way really long. I'm sorry. Okay, keep going. All right, so where do we begin? We need to build a foundation. And this, these are the three R's. Remove, replenish, and repair. And remember that the, the first tax law and the second tax law, if you're sitting on a tax, the appropriate treatment is tax removal. If you're sitting on two tax, removing one does not produce a 50% improvement. So we've got to get all the tax. And how we do that? One at a time. Maybe we hit two or three at a time. That's awesome because then we see oh, amazing stuff. Um, so what do we want to remove? Sugars, junk foods, preservatives. And I will give you a list of alternatives and I will help you make this change because that is the thing. Universally, I have heard, we can't do the diet. I don't know. We can't do, we can't do the diet. We can't do, we cannot do the diet. We can't. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. And if you realize that the reason your child is acting the way he or she is is because they're making drugs from the food that you're giving them, would you not throw out the pain medicine in the cabinet if that were the issue? Yeast overgrowth, yeast produces alcohol. Constipation, eating those carbs, getting those grains and um, all that sugar and they got constipation. You got yeast, sugar, and grains, wheat, and they're not going to the bathroom. They're not pooping because they're making their own opiates. So they're constipated. So you got a nice, warm area to ferment in, and they're making their own alcohol. You don't have a child anymore. You have a still. And when you got a still who also has problems with opiates, they're mixing drugs and alcohol. That's why it's so hard, and that's why you need help. And that's why we will help you. And we will hook you up with other people who need help too. <laughs> um, OK, so what we want to do is we want to eliminate toxins in food and water and the environment to the best of our ability. And when we live in an area like where we live, and in other areas of the country too, there's lots of toxins, but we've got a lot here. Um, we want to do the best we can. And I have a, I'm going to do a presentation later this month that's going to go further into the toxins and give some ideas about what we can do. Um, this is the diet. Gluten-free, casein-free, soy-free, yeast-free, special or specific carbohydrate diet, and low oxalate diet. And that's not all. There's also the GAPS diet. And paleo diet, which is really having some great effects. Because the thing is, is that when you've got all these bugs, you want to stop feeding them. So you want to stop giving them stuff that's hard to break down. You want to stop giving them things that are... Um, that are going to sit and ferment. And when we do that, then we start seeing them come off of that drugged out, spaced out kind of thing. And kids have started talking. They, their eye contact improves. They're, they get better when we address these things. Not, I mean, not, it's not universal, but a lot of them get better. OK, so replenish. We want to put back that good flora. So we want probiotics. And fermented foods have been huge for a lot of people because fermented foods are easy to do. They're cheap. It's not hard to do. It's not hard to learn how to do. And I happen to have somebody who knows how to do it. So um, this is when you're using, when you're buying probiotics, if you go to the store and you buy probiotics, you want to get one that has multiple strains and you want to get one that is, has to be refrigerated because yeast will change. So if you use only one, it will mutate and it will become resistant to it. But fermented foods seem to be the ones, seem to work a whole lot better than probiotics from what we're learning now. So that's an awesome new thing, semi-new. Um, enzymes to break down those proteins so that they don't get into the bloodstream and become identified as opiates. And that makes it easier to break that addiction cycle, which makes it easier to change the diet. Um, nutrients, we want nutrients, nutrients, nutrients. And we're going to talk more about diet and nutrients later um, in the month. So vitamins, minerals, and essential fatty acids. And the, four, the third R is repair. 
Antimicrobials. I like herbals. Um, I like to look at things that will target more than one thing. I don't want to just do this for virus, this for bacteria, this for parasites, this for whatever. Something that works really well for a lot of kids is coconut oil. Uh, extra virgin coconut oil because it is antiviral, antibacterial, antiparasitic, antifungal, and it also boosts your memory. It's been, um, it, it has the um, MCT, uh, which is used in Alzheimer's patients' drugs, and it, it's, it's amazing for a lot of kids, as long as your kid is not allergic to tree nuts and has a coconut allergy, which happens. Um, okay, so antifungals, we wanna get rid of that yeast, which sounds really easy, and it is really difficult. Um, there's uh, some strategies that we can use for that. Antivirals, if they have um, you know, evidence of herpes viruses or measles, um, which is, you know, those are issues that we deal with. Antibacterials, um, I'm not gonna go into the bacterias right now because I don't, we don't wanna talk about that right now. That's just de depressing. Bacterial infection, uh, Clostridia, C. diff, those are really difficult. And when you have a child, that's a clue too. If your child is really mean, a lot of the time. If they have gastrointestinal problems and the, uh, bacterial infections make kids mean, that's, that's a sign. Um, immunotherapy, um, not gonna go into that too much, but HBOT has been really good, hyperbaric oxygen, oxygen therapy and um, IVIG, um, essential fatty acids and changing the diet. You can do a lot with diet and essential fatty acids. Oxytocin is really cool. Oxytocin has been studied for quite some time, and there's some research, really interesting research, that suggests that um, people who, women who have problems dilating during the pregnancy, and they have to get that pitocin to, to induce their labor, they may have a glitch in their body's ability to produce and utilize oxytocin, which may be passed on to the kid. So that's something we might want to think about too. And if, if the parent had, if the mom had to have Pitocin because she couldn't dilate, that might be a sign that oxytocin might be something we might want to try. And, and some people have reported amazing things with oxytocin. That's that, that um, bonding hormone. That's what's produced when you're breastfeeding and you're looking at that baby and they're looking at you and it's just love fest. That's what oxytocin does. Um, and then we want to think about detoxification. And, and I'm going to use the, the C word, the chelation. Um, but chelation is not always medication. Chelation can be natural, sub, uh, natural substances. It can be some. Um, it, it can be um, over the counter. It can be oral. It can be um, IV. So there's a whole broad range of chelation. Um, I'm going to talk about antifungals. Er, I sort of went through this. Herbals, aloe vera juice. I would never recommend anything but George's. I do not own any stock in the company, but um, too many times people have bought other aloe vera juices and they waste their money because they're bitter. George's has no taste. It tastes like water. It's a little bit thicker than water and it's clear. And George's aloe vera juice, aloe vera is toxic to yeast. And it also helps with constipation. And aloe vera, like you put it on your skin and you've got, you know, it helps to heal your skin from sunburn. It helps heal the, ga the gastrointestinal tract as well. Um, enzymes, we talked, candidase and candex are, are specific enzymes that help to target yeast. Grapefruit seed extract is good for yeast um, unless you have an allergy to grapefruit. Um, oil of oregano is also good. We talked about um, coconut oil too. Saccharomyces boulardii, that's just a really fancy name for a specific strain of yeast. And the theory behind that is, is that you want to get the bad yeast out, so you put the good yeast in and it crowds them out. It's like, this is my spot, I'm coming in, get out. Um, so nystatin is an antifungal. Nystatin, amphotericin B, a lot of people don't like that one. Um, a lot of doctors don't like that one. Um, Diflucan, Spornox, Lamisil, Nizarel. This is where the, the comprehensive digestive stool analysis can be very helpful because if we get it with uh, the sensitivity test, it can tell us, they'll take a little bit of the stool and they'll put it in and, and, they'll take the, and it'll tell us if the yeast is sensitive and what's, what, um, of the antifungals the yeast is sensitive to and which ones we don't need to waste our time with because it's resistant. Um, and antibacterial, antiviral treatment, <coughs> herbals, onions, garlic, lysine, grapeseed extract, and turmeric, um, antibiotics. Some may need long-term oral vancomycin. Um, there's some people, there's doctors that are treating pandas with long-term antibiotics. And um, you know, a lot of people just swear by it because their kid gets better. Their kid gets better on the antibiotics and they love it and they don't want to go off it. They're scared they're going to regress. 
and sometimes they do. And there's some kids that have to be on an antibiotic forever, um, which I would use as a, I mean, I just don't think that's the first line that we need to be doing. You know, there are some other things that we can do. My daughter was diagnosed with PANDAS, and we never used long-term antibiotics, and she's, she, she's, she's awesome. <laughs> she lost her diagnosis. Um, Lauracetin, vitamin A, Valtrex, cyclovirs, these are all um, the antibacterial and antivirals. And chelation and detoxification, there's, those, there's that word. So these are some that are available and that people use. Um, transdermal means on the skin. Thiamine is a big part of it for a lot of people because it kind of kicks in that um, detox pathway, that methylation pathway. If you're not getting a response, if some people, some people who have not had access to the um, MTHFR testing and the, and the methylation pathway testing, have, um, they've not had a good response when they've used methyl B12 and folinic acid initially, but when they back off and then they start the thiamine first and then they go back and revisit it, something kicks in. So that's telling us there's a glitch in that pathway. It's really cool when you can just do the test and look at it and say, okay, let's do this. Um, so DMSA, DMPS, these are um, chelators, uh, can be done orally, DMSA, especially orally and over the, uh, you, you don't have to have a prescription for. EDTA can be done rectally, um, it can also be done um, IV, that's the one that people get really scared about because there have been, um, from what I can see, I think three deaths associated with EDTA and it wasn't the EDTA, it was the wrong form of EDTA that caused things, and they, they weren't, they weren't um, making sure that minerals were supplemented and that nutritional status was okay, and they used the wrong drug. They didn't know what they were doing. You know, I mean, if I amputate your left leg and you've got gangrene on your right foot, you're not going to have a good outcome. You know, it was the wrong drug. It wasn't the chelation, it's the wrong drug. Um, so DMSA and ALA, this is alpha lipoic acid. Alpha lipoic acid gets mercury out of the brain. And to my knowledge, it's the only thing that gets mercury out of the brain. And when you start chelating, you're going to start, you want to get mercury out. Okay, we want to get that mercury because everybody's heard about how bad mercury is, and it is. It's really bad. But mercury doesn't travel alone. Um, mercury frequently travels with arsenic, antimony, and um, aluminum. Those are the three A's of autism. And it also travels with lead and cadmium. So we frequently will see kids and we'll see adults who have all of these heavy metals and we start chelating and they're like, well, I don't see the lead, I don't see the lead. Well, the lead's not coming out yet because we got to get this other stuff out first because they're the gatekeepers for the mercury. So you'll start seeing those things come out first. And when you start improving, here's the thing on, on hair analysis, we see people who have high aluminum, high lead, high cadmium, high antimony, arsenic, uranium, barium, all of these things on their hair analysis, and their mercury is flat. They don't have any mercury in their hair analysis. That's because it's not coming out. It's in the brain and it's not coming out. So they look like they don't have any, and if you don't know how to interpret a hair analysis correctly, a doctor will say, well, he doesn't have any mercury. That's a sign that he does. If he's got all these other ones, or he's got elevations, and he's got the minerals are all dysregulated, that's a sign that there's mercury and he's not coming out of the body. And we need to figure out why. Um, okay, so, oops. Homeopathy has been really big for a lot of kids and, and adults. Um, chlorella is, a lot of people use it. Uh, magnesium sulfate, this is Epsom salt. And Epsom salt is really good around here because we have a lot of, mag a lot of um, sulfur dioxide in our air. So our body is getting the signal that we've got way too much sulfur already, so we can't use it. So it's just shutting everything down, and we can't process it. But we need that, and that's part of the reason, I believe, uh, through observation over several years, why we have so many people with connective tissue disorder, because sulfur is a major component of t connective tissue in the body. If you can't use sulfur because you're lacking the enzyme or it's dysregulated, it, it's, it's deactivated, so you can't use it, then you can't rebuild. So we get a lot of back problems, we get a lot of, we got a lot of flat feet, we've got people with acid reflux and bladder issues. All of those things are, all of those things are connective tissue. And it, it also is, connective tissue is involved in how your, how your neurons work from the front to the back and the right to the left. Because all those bundles of neurons are held together by connective tissue. So if you've got connective tissue weaknesses, this can help. This is a really easy way to help. The um, magnesium sulfates, Epsom salts, 
bath, Epsom salts bath. Start low, start slow. Um, aloe vera ascorbic acid flush, that's one that's good for um, ascorbic acid flush, kills um, yeast, and it also chelates lead from the lower bowel. Um, bentonite clay, MSM, which is uh, sulfur, and N-acetylcysteine. But you gotta be careful with these if you've got yeast because they'll feed it. So, before any of this, assess and address mineral and nutritional deficiencies. Extremely important. Ongoing. Assess and repair detox pathways. Methylation and sulfation. Constipation and yeast. It, again, that's how we get rid of stuff. Constipation, if, if we can't get rid of it, then we certainly don't want to knock it loose and have it circulating around and not without any place to go. Okay, so summary. Yay! Um, the most important things to do, gather the data, 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 data. Um, listen to the patient, which is the child or the person who is ill, and the parent. But a lot of times, even if a kid is nonverbal, they can tell us stuff. You just got to listen. Um, learn from the history. Take one thing at a time. Our children are extremely sensitive. That's why they're reacting in ways that we don't expect them to react, because they are so sensitive. They can't handle it. So we've got to be very, very careful. And keep detailed records of progress, and keep your eye on the prize. Never, never give up. This is the prize. Improved overall health, improved behavior, improved socialization, improved speech, and improved future. And follow those who seek the truth, but flee from those who have found it. If an expert tells you there is nothing that can be done and nothing has been tried, then you only have one expert's opinion. Find another expert and don't give up without trying. Do we have time for this? Just one? OK. Um, and I don't, do I have to push it down there? No? Yes? Sorry. Did it? There it comes. This is one of many recovery video videos that are um, on the web. Ethan Spencer. He also had floppy child syndrome, diffuse hypotonia. The feeling of when I move his arm, there's some resistance there, and there's none there. It's floppy. That's hypermobile. They're hypermobile. There's just a lot of mobility there. And he was unresponsive to pain. He had tactile defensiveness, avoidant of eye contact, and did not share enjoyment. Who's this? Who's this to the camera? Who is it? He had bacterial and fungal overgrowth in his intestines. And he had darkness and puffy eyes from food and fungus leaking from his gut. Where's your nose? I was a new therapist when I met Ethan. The only thing that he would respond to was a Mickey Mouse thing that you pushed and it twirled around. Where is she? Where, Where is, is she? Can you look at Nora? Where's Nora's eyes? Whoa. That's interesting. That's interesting. He's been uh -huh. doing that. right side of his face, including his right eye, wouldn't respond the same way as his left. And his leg movements and stability were abnormal.
Not everyone responds to combination antiviral, antifungal therapies, but Ethan did. We started him off on Valtrex and Nizoral, and on his second day he had this horrible healing regression. A rash broke out on his face and moved down his body, and when it reached his stomach he had this horrible diarrhea. Once that went away, so did all of his negative symptoms. Ethan then just started doing these amazing developmental things that we had never seen before. That's nice. This one. Where, where is this? Where is this? It's a doggy. A doggy. Do you like music? I like music. Do you like music? You dance? Okay, let's dance. <laughs> Come on, dance with me. <laughs> Between the gains made from his dietary intervention and this one on his 21st day of his antiviral treatment, even the naysayers were taking a second look. No one that saw him every single day could deny how dramatically he changed. Ethan, Ethan, Ethan it's your turn. Okay, I know it. You guys are done. Can I take it? Where are you taking it? It's on your back. And you're going to take it to the bay? He's doing sender receiver all by himself. Thank you. Yeah, I want another one. When I first started working with Ethan, I couldn't get him to pay attention to me at all, and he was tantruming a lot. And he was over three years old, and he hadn't started his potty training. From what I've seen, it seems like the bi biological has played a significant role. The makeup of his body and his ability to function has changed at a much quicker rate. He carries himself differently. He runs differently. He, he speaks differently. It seems like a lot of obstacles have been removed for him. To take someone from such a low stage, you know, all the way up, it's amazing. I mean, it truly is. Hi. Let me see your happy face. And let me see your sad face. And let me see your surprise face. And what's this? A weasel. What's that? A dolphin. A dolphin. What is this? You know what that is? A snowman. A snowman. That's pretty good for a boy in California. Ethan, I want to have a turn. No, I have a turn. Really? Can I share with you? No. Really? So Ethan, I'm sad. I want a turn. Can I have a turn? Here. Thank I, you. I got one. Oh, thank you for both of them. Thank you. Oh. Okay. I'm going to have fun now. Here we go. Chugga, 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 chugga. And I think to myself, what a wonderful world. So, uh, as I was saying, that's one of a large number, and I'm happy to say a growing number, of recovery videos that are on YouTube and on the, on the web. So, um, I thank you all for coming tonight and bearing with me. I know this was very long, and I really appreciate your attentiveness and, and um, coming, and I hope you'll... Uh, come again. This was the, the, a very long overview. Um, I'll try to not be so windy next time, but um, thanks. Appreciate it.